had to cross that Red Sea. And I started thinking about how does this relate to me, Lord? Like, how did how how does this relate to me? And then it clicked because in the New Testament it talks about the um, the Red Sea being synonymous with baptism. And I started thinking, you know, it's Christ that leads us to repentance. It's Christ that leads us to see ourselves and see our sinful nature. And when we see this, he leads us to baptism. And it made sense why the Red Sea came before Mount Sinai. Because then when they had passed through the Red Sea, right, they went through the wilderness. And after they went through the wilderness, they ended up at Mount Sinai where the law was given. And I started to think about this even more. And then I saw the huge parallel. You know, a lot of times us as Adventists or even us as Christians, we want people to be perfect. We want people to, to be to a certain level before baptism. But the thing that this journey has showed me since Pastor Seek has been going over it is that baptism is the beginning. Baptism is where we see our need for Christ. We see that we, 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 see that we need Christ to be our lead. Right? To lead us to the promised land, right? And when we see this need and when we see our lacking, that's when we should give our life to Christ. And as we even though even though we're not perfect, we are not keeping all the commandments, we see our need for Christ. And through this need, right, He is leading us, and we have the promise that one day He will write His laws on our minds, just as just as when God gave the children of Israel the commandments on Mount Sinai. And it just really stood out to me. And I just want to say one last thing. You know, if there's anyone that's in here that sees their need for Christ and they feel like they're not to the place where they want to be or they're not worthy to, to enter that pool, it's if you see your need for Christ, that is where the step, the step begins. It's the beginning of the journey. And you have the promise of God that he will lead you to the promised land and he will write that law, his laws on your heart. So that kind of really just stuck, stuck out to me last week. And I was just sharing that with Pastor, so. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I really wanted Java to share that because it illustrates what I have said and I'm gonna to continue to say repeatedly, so you'll hear it a lot. I really, really encourage you to do your own study and reading and your own thinking about these symbols. Because God will work out in your individual experience what is significant for you. And that was something that was significant for Javid. And it struck him. And I believe that's the work of the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. To say, hey, here's something that is meaningful to me in my experience. So I encourage you with the utmost amount of energy and every pore and soul and fiber and whatever other anatomy term I can come up with to, to have you examine and think about these elements of the sanctuary and of those seven areas of increasing holiness and allow the Lord to do something very unique in your own experience. It's unique to you. That's why I wanted to share. So I encourage each one of you to really make this thing personal. Let's bow our heads for prayer before we get into our, uh, our lesson today. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for taking these lessons and illustrations and symbols and making them real in our own lives. Help us to understand the significance and the learning lessons of the veil, the curtain. Lord, we trust that your spirit will teach each one of us what each one of us specifically needs because we want to know you in an individual, personal, and real way. We ask because of Jesus. Amen. All right, first I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 38. Exodus chapter 38. Okay? Exodus chapter 38, and as you're going to Exodus chapter 38, we're going to look at, at verse 18. I want to just go back and kind of walk you through a little bit. We have looked at these seven areas, Egypt, the wilderness, and then the encampment, and then that sacred hollow square. But I want you to think about what it would have been like for an Israelite 
as they have come out of Egypt, they have encountered God in a powerful way in the, in the solitude of the wilderness. God has given them His laws, His instruction. He has formed them and given them instruction for their daily life. But as they go about their life, they find that just as Dwayne illustrated earlier, when he asked the question, it's, we're only 16 days into the new year. How many of you have not sinned yet in those first 16 days? And we all chuckle. But it illustrates exactly what I want you to think about as you think about the Israelite. He's in the encampment. He's in his daily life. He's gotten his instruction from the Lord. And now he's made a huge boo-boo. He's messed up. What does he do about it? And so he takes his sacrifice and he begins to journey across that open, clean area, that hollow square as he's headed towards the courtyard. And he also has to realize that other people are looking and wondering, right? Because as you're carrying your lamb across that two-thirds of a mile area, everybody can see you. And so as you're looking out, you're going, oh, there's Alfonso taking a lamb into the sanctuary. <laughs> wonder what he did. But there you are. But as you approach, as you approach, and you are approaching from what side? What's the only way you can get into the sanctuary? What direction? From the east, right? The only opening into the courtyard is the east. There is only one way into the presence of God, and what is that way? By the intermediary work of Jesus. Jesus and Jesus only. But as you get close to that, get that entryway, there is a curtain or a veil that goes around, that encloses the courtyard. And let's take a look in Exodus 38, verse 18. It says, The screen of the gate of the court was woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and a fine woven linen. The length was 20 cubits, and the height along its width was 5 cubits, corresponding to the hangings of the court. So we see that this tapestry, which was of fine linen, white, it also had blue, and what are the two colors? Purple, and what? Scarlet. There were also gold threads that were woven into that veil. And along sections of that veil were woven in the images of angels. <coughs> Now, we can just ignore all that and just jump right into the courtyard and take care of business and get out to get back to the rest of our day. Or we can take a moment to ponder what Jesus was trying to tell us by the construction of that veil. I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 10. It was our scripture reading, but we're going to look at it again. Hebrews chapter 10, because... This helps us to understand what God was trying to tell his people. Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the what? The blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is what? His flesh. So that veil was supposed to symbolize what? The flesh of Jesus. What does the flesh of Jesus really mean? If He is flesh, what is He? I heard it. Somebody said it? He's human. He is human indeed. That flesh is His humanity. And we're going to get back to that in a little bit. But I want to read a passage from Desire of Ages. This is Desire of Ages, page 23. It says, Nearly 2,000 years ago, a voice of mysterious import 
was heard in heaven from the throne of God. Lo, I come, sacrificing and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And that's Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7. In these words is announced the fulfillment of the purpose that had been hidden from eternal ages. Christ was about to visit our world and to become incarnate, he said. That was his with the Father before the world was, we could not have endured the light of his presence. That we might behold it and not be destroyed, the manifestation of his glory was shrouded. His divinity was veiled with humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. So Jesus came as a human being, but he veiled his divinity, the glory of his divinity, in humanity. So his, fe his flesh served as the veil, that thing which would tone down the glory of his divinity so that he could be in the presence of humanity. Now, there's something interesting about the flesh of Christ. I want us to just briefly take a look at it. It's in Isaiah 53. Take your Bible and turn to Isaiah 53. There aren't many chapters in the Bible any more meaningful than Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And verse 2. It says in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or beauty, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So what was the physical appearance of Jesus like? It doesn't sound like he would have gotten on People magazines. 50 sexiest people in the world, right? Probably not. It says that he had a very plain appearance. There was nothing about his appearance that would make you go, wow, hey, this is awesome. I want to go be near this guy. It all came through his character. But this was his veil. Now, I want to go back to the veil of the sanctuary. And let's just consider the symbolism that is there and what it tells us about Christ and our connection to Him. It's rather interesting that the animals provided the wool that was used, the plants provided the cotton, and the soil provided the gold and the silver that was used not only in that tapestry but also throughout the sanctuary. And it really helps us to understand that Jesus was made from the elements of this earth. Isn't that fascinating? Just as you and I are made from the elements of this earth, Jesus was made from the elements of this earth. He was one with us. It also helps us to understand that God loves beauty. Do you agree with that? Amen. God loves beauty. God did not have them just place some simple sheet up to enclose the courtyard. You had a beautiful, beautiful tapestry. A veil that was of clean, white linen. It had purple, blue, and scarlet with gold thread, with angels woven into it. This was beautiful. Take a look at Psalm 29 and verse 2. I want you to look at Psalm 29 and verse 2. Here's what David says in developing these psalms. It says, Give unto the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in what? The beauty of holiness. The beauty of holiness. That, but that word holiness could also be sanctuary. And it's very likely that that was David's intent. Worship God in the beauty of His sanctuary, the beauty of His holiness. Because the sanctuary was such a wonderful, beautiful place. David was, was just enamored with the sanctuary, wasn't he? 
What was his greatest desire and goal in life? To build a permanent structure for God. To build a house, a temple for God. That was his aim. That was what he wanted his legacy to be. You know, we talk about that in, in politics here in this country. You know, every president that, that comes into power in this country, you know, when they leave, they want history and everybody to look upon them kindly, right? They want to have a legacy. David was enamored with the sanctuary, the colors and the splendor of it. Think about it. The sounds, the sounds of the Levite musicians that performed there, the smell of the incense, and the smell of those fresh loaves of bread that were in the holy place. So the sanctuary was a place that would appeal to all of your senses. Sight, hearing, smell. I want you to turn to Psalm 22 and verse 3. Psalm 22, verse 3. It says, but you are holy. Now who's the you? That's God. But God, you are holy, enthroned in the what? In the praises of Israel. You see, this was God's house. And God's house was designed and structured so that when you came to it, Every one of your senses was enraptured, ennobled, drawn up to the, to the majesty of God so that your heart just wanted to cry out in praise. Kind of like the song, Jennifer. Why should we be discouraged, right? So the, the sanctuary was set up and designed to appeal to our senses so that when we saw the sanctuary, there was no sense of discouragement. Designed to fill us with the beauty and the holiness of God. I want to read here a passage from, this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 349. It says, no language can describe the glory of the scene presented within the sanctuary. The gold-plated walls reflecting the light from the golden candlestick. The brilliant hues of the richly embroidered curtains with their shining angels. The table and the altar of incense glittering with gold. Beyond the second veil, the sacred ark with its mystic cherubim and above it the holy Shekinah. The visible manifestation of Jehovah's presence. All but a dim reflection of the glories of the temple of God in heaven. The great center of the work for man's redemption. So a part of our growth in redemption is learning to praise and glorify God. God wanted us to be filled every sense of our body with the beauty of His presence. Now let's just take a look at some of the colors there and what they symbolize as you're approaching this. Now let me also say that, that this, this gate or this veil here that, uh, this, as you approach the sanctuary, you know it did not block out everything that was happening inside. So you could actually see through it. And now when you get something that's kind of opaque like that, have you ever, have you ever had uh, something that is uh, the mesh of the, the material is large enough that you can see through it? It does block some of your vision, but you can see through it. Now, how does that work? The closer you get to it, can you see more or less of what is going on on the other side? More, right? When you get further away from it, those openings in the mesh kind of are smaller, you can't seem to see, but the closer you get, the more you see through, and the more inviting it becomes. Jesus, I believe, is there is telling us, when you get to me, the more you will see through to the glory of my character, the more you will see and the more you will be drawn, the more your senses will be filled the closer you come to me in that, in that beautiful tapestry that's set off the courtyard. Now, blue. What does blue mean? Blue comes from the sky is blue, right? The oceans are blue. 
We also use the term blue to illustrate a particular character trait, right? He is true blue. True blue, right? What does that mean? You're solid, you're loyal, right? Blue is a sense of loyalty. It also, as I heard somebody represent, or say, represents the law, right? It represents the law and loyalty and fidelity. So that blue is there to help remind people of God's law and His faithfulness and His loyalty. And then the scarlet, what does that represent? I heard it. Somebody said it's the color of what? Blood. What does blood have to do with the sanctuary and with man's redemption? We know, right? That sacrifice. The sacrifice had to shed its blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or remission of sin. So you have the reminder that our sin is require the death of the Son of God Himself. And the purple. What is the purple? Pardon? The blending of the two, right? How do you get purple? Take the blue and the scarlet, the blue and the red, and when they are mixed, you get purple. And so here we see in the purple the fact that God Himself must suffer when we break His law. When we break the law of God, Jesus hurts. Jesus hurts. Also in that blood, the redness of that blood, we realize that the breaking of God's law interrupts and damages the flow of life. You follow me? Blood. Blood must be shed. Blood must be spilled because of sin. And even today, you, need, you realize we don't think about that because we don't have to go through this ritual, which I'm glad we don't, aren't you? Oh, I'm glad that we don't have to have a bunch of sheep up here slaughtered today. And I'm glad that I don't have to go through the ritual of dealing with that blood and catching it and sprinkling it and all the rest. But I think we need to remember and that veil helps us to remember with that purple color that when we commit sin, it damages and disrupts the flow of life because that's what blood is. Blood is the flow of life. That purple color. Here is, I think, a neat description of what that purple does. This is from the book With Jesus in His Sanctuary from page 85. It says, "People, re purple reminds us of the blue of his heavenly nature, saddened by the crimson of his broken heart, of divinity burdened with humanity, yet triumphing in the prince who became our priest. Isn't that beautiful? I thought that was really beautiful in describing the purple. Now I want you to go to Hebrews. I want you to go to Hebrews because... This veil, this tapestry, the beauty of this tapestry, which helps to draw our minds to Christ, helps us to get a picture of Christ that Hebrews describes outright. It's illustrated in symbolic form in the, in the veil of the sanctuary, the curtain of the sanctuary, but Hebrews explains it. And here it is, Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 16 and 17. Hebrews chapter 2, it says, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brother, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. But I want to go back to the beginning of 17. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brother. What does that mean to you? Help me out. I want you to think a little bit. What does that mean to you? That in all things, Jesus had to be made like his brother. First off, who's his brother? Us. What does it mean that he was made in all ways like us? 
He was flesh and blood. We've seen that in some of the symbolism here, right? We looked at the symbolism of all this stuff. It says that Jesus was made of the same substance of the earth, just as we are. But he was made like us. What does that mean? Give me some descriptions of what that means to you when it says Jesus was made in all ways like us. To be tempted. Okay, we're going to read that too as well because we need that balance. Because if, if we get unbalanced with this, we could say, well, Jesus was sinful like me, right? No. Hebrews 4 tells us that he was tempted in all ways like us, but what? Without sin. But I want you to think about that. How, what does that mean to you? Jesus was made in all ways like you. Okay, he understands us. That helps him to understand. What else did you No advantage? Okay, no advantage. He doesn't, does that mean then that we can live? Without committing sin? Wow. Make it does. What else? What else to you does it? We can have victory over sin, right? But what else does that mean to you? He was made in all ways. And I'm curious. I'm not looking for anything in particular when I ask this. I'm, I'm just wanting to hear from you, to hear how the Spirit's working in your heart. How that, how that grabs you in your individual experience. If you didn't hear that, he says, Jesus experienced the same emotions that we have, the same thoughts. It's kind of all of the spectrum of human experience Jesus felt. You know, I, I've got to say, there was one thing that uh, my friend Paul Conniff in his ministry, Straight to the Heart, has really helped me to understand. I think it would be this. And particularly when we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and when we understand how Jesus was tempted as we are tempted, and he experienced and felt what we feel. Folks, when you commit sin, do you have an awful feeling in your gut? That's, what, that's the term we use. Do you? Do you feel bad? Do you feel a sense of self-loathing? Absolutely. i got to say, one of, the, one of the most amazing things to me was watching the interview of Ted Bundy. And I'm not going to go into details, obviously, but how many of you know who Ted Bundy was? Hey, quite a few of you. For those of you who don't, just enough, Ted Bundy was a serial killer that was executed in Florida probably 20, 25 years ago. The, right, the night before his execution, he was interviewed by James Dobson with Focus on the Family. And Ted Bundy said that when he would go out and commit one of these horrible crimes, that afterwards he would just be overcome with guilt, with just this awful, horrible feeling. But obviously, rather than taking that to the Lord, he just tried to deal with it himself. And then eventually it would kind of pass. And then the desire to go and commit the crime again would build. But folks, I think that's something we can all relate to, can't we? We all had that. Where you commit a sin, you feel terrible about it, you feel awful. And you might even feel like, you know what, I don't want to go to God because I know He's mad at me. And I, I, whatever, whatever it does, it keeps you from it. And the next thing you know, kind of the, the, the pain of that passes away and then the, the desire to do it again builds. But it just struck me. It, 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 you, you sensed a real spirit of anguish that was in this man. Because that's what sin does. Remember what we said, sin disrupts the flow of life. Sin destroys. It puts poison into the river of life. That's what sin does. And so all of the anguish that we feel, that self-loathing, all of that, Jesus felt. He took all of that into his being. So that he could take it to the cross, nail it to the cross, and kill it there. And then he can come into your experience and give the peace and the joy that he has as the one who lived in perfect obedience, in perfect connection with his Father. And he transfers that to you. Folks, I really believe that all of that 
All of that can be told just in the tapestry of the sanctuary. Just in that beautiful linen woven with purple and blue and red and gold with angels embroidered in it. All of it was to try and get the human mind to look at that and to contemplate what Christ was and what he meant and what he could do in your life and experience. It is my prayer that each one of you will ponder that beautiful veil and what it means for you in your walk with Jesus. Let me invite our song leader up as we get ready to sing our closing hymn. Take your hymnals, turn to hymn number 190 for our closing hymn, Jesus Loves Me. Hymn number 190. Let's stand. 